but the fearlessly factor. And fear factor, it's an American show, it's a stunt show, and shows contestants uh, that uh, go against each other in a variety of uh, situations. And the participants have to face frightening situations. And they've offered money or the possibility to continue if they're able to overcome their fears. And, um, and some, some are pretty horrible, you know, they eat spiders and uh, they go in tanks with snakes and all sorts of things. And it's, it's kind of uh, horrible. <laughs> Did you heard, uh, listen about this man last week, he, he was in a contest of spider meat or cockroach eating and he died. That's disgusting. People lose so many weird things. Now, today I'm not going to talk about weird things. But it's the title of my message, not the fear factor, but the fearlessly factor. And I want to tell you that God uh, um, has a plan for you, and very often circumstances in our life are frightening. Uh, uh, so sometimes there are things that come to take off our joy, uh, but we have some goals and some objectives. So today we're going to talk about overcoming fear and discouragement, and as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. So, so uh, it's built in in our spirit. So we have a dose of supernatural power that will help us to overcome frightening situations. Now, God has this plan for you. And I want to tell you that in the Bible, there are 365 times there is an expression that says, Fear not. Amen. 365 times. One for each day of the year. So it, let me tell you that courage is not the absence of fear either. It's how to master fear. How to master discouragement. So I'd like to, to, to read today on the book of Nehemiah. So we're going to study the book of Nehemiah, which is in the Old Testament. It's a fantastic book. Nehemiah was the leader of the Jews. Uh, and he returned from Babylon to Israel. Uh, with uh, a possibility of rebuilding the walls that had been destroyed because of war. So, uh, and God called him and gave him this plan to rebuild what uh, was teared down. And they were uh, very excited initially, so he was able to gather uh, everybody and they started working. They were so excited and they worked diligently. And um, it, it says that about when they arrived to half of the construction, they started to have problems. And the work was going well, people were excited, the wall was going up, and something happened. And what happened is that they gave room to discouragement. So let's read this passage uh, in Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole uh, chapter, but let's start on verse number 6. And the Bible says, So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half his height. For the people had a mind to work. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them night and day. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. Uh, uh, at that time the Jews who lived near came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us or you need to stop. So here's the picture of what was going on. Jerusalem was destroyed and, and they were called to rebuild the, from, the, from the ruins. And you know that the Holy Spirit today gives us also an anointing to rebuild. Maybe not a physical wall, but to rebuild the presence of God in our land, to rebuild, you know, the church, a strong church in our city, in our community. God gives us an anointing to do exploits, to do mighty things. But guess what? When we start building, there's enemies, there's opposition, there's all sorts of things. Because once the wall is, is done, 
there is phenomenal progress and phenomenal blessing and anointing. And we need to apply the principles that Israel lived in the natural to our spiritual life. And that's what we're going to do today as we learn about discouragement. Now, what are the causes of discouragement? We see from this passage that they had two causes. Inner causes and external causes. Inner or internal causes. And internal, it's because they were tired, tiredness, frustration and fear. And external was the criticism, the mockery and the fear that was instigated by those people. So whenever in our life we face situations of fear or discouragement, we also have causes. There's also always a cause for everything and for every feeling. So let's see what, what happened with the uh, uh, inner causes. So on verse 10, he says that they had uh, heavy burdens to carry. My question is, do you carry heavy burdens in your life? Some people carry really heavy burdens, circumstances of life. The Bible says that, that there was too much rubble. Is there too much rubble also in, in your life? Is your life cluttered with, with rubble? And in order to uh, do a rubble cleanup, you, have to, uh, have to, you need to have a lot of patience. I, I don't know if you have ever seen a situation you know, of, a, uh, of a building that was destroyed, you have all the rubble. Uh, probably you watch on, on TV. I, I hope you never went through the situation, those hurricanes that happened uh, just south of our border, uh, all those, those things. When we see a destruction that really levels cities to nothing, to zero, it's nothing but rubble. You know, uh, uh, this week uh, I, I was sleeping, it was about midnight, and uh, seven kilometers from my house, that was the epicenter of a heart earthquake, and the house started to shake and and uh, you know i was awake i woke up my 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 uh, youngest son too and said whoa you haven't felt this and i said yes yes and i started to pray and i and i, I and, and then i i went on the internet to, to see if it was really you know earthquake or if there was just a truck coming or something <laughs> and it was a strong earthquake and started over there and just swept montreal and i thought this is what the Lord wants to do. He wants to shake the foundations of our city. And everything He does in the spirit, first He does it in the natural. Yeah. Very often so uh, uh, that His children, children of God will understand what God wants to do. He wants just to shake the foundations. And sometimes rubble is necessary because He wants to rebuild. The rebuilding of the wall was a very important prophetic act. That's why we have the book of Nehemiah and, uh, and Ezra. We have these books in, in the Bible. And, uh, and so we see that they stop the work. On verses 11 and 12, uh, we also see that there were the voices of the enemies that affected them. They started to have their doubts. Um, now too much rubble in our life, doubts and voices of the enemies will affect and will cause fear. Certain times it's, it's very, something very simple. You get a new job and you're not qualified for the job. And you know you're not qualified, but it's such a nice job. And, and you, you say, well, I think I'm not qualified. Guess what? God will qualify you to do the job. Don't listen to the people that say it's too much for you or it's over your head. Because, you know, you have so many people wanting to discourage you. But uh, as, as God's children, we should be vessels of encouragement. Amen? Amen? But unfortunately, just like in the day of Nehemiah, today, there's also those that cause great trouble. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, I love this verse, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And this is mentioning, a, it's like a stadium where you're running. You're there running. And guess who's in the stadium? Spectators. So in a stadium, you have the ones that run and the ones that are doing something. And then you have such a cloud of spectators. And there's usually more spectators than athletes. So this is the comparison that Paul is giving. And he says, we are surrounded. So we need to lay aside every weight and the sin. So, so as we do so, we will overcome the discouragement. 
Now, let me mention also the external cases that were happening. Criticism was the first thing, and the, criticism is a constant source of discouragement. Are you often criticized by others? I don't know about you, but I am. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't complain. Uh, but uh, I, I need to know how to handle criticism. And criticism, so many times, comes even from other Christians. People that should have the same goals as we do. Amen. Listen, Jesus was preaching the kingdom of God. He was the Messiah. And the priests who should worship him were criticizing him. And they ended up sending him to the cross and dooming him and condemning him to death. Though he was doing the call of God, not only for his life, but for their lives. So he knew how to handle criticism. And uh, there's a next level of criticism, which is mockery. And mockery, uh, it, it's what, what was happening there. They, they were saying, oh, look at the wall, it's going to fall. You know, a, a fox will come and the wall will fall. And it's, it's poorly built, look at this. They think they're going to do something, but they would not be able to. They knew it was a great danger to them. So that this is why they decided to uh, mock them. And they, they, uh, they even told them, these feeble Jews, you know, these people, who do they think they are? And, and you know, today, the church is mocked uh, on the media, on the news uh, organizations, they mock the church. They mock men and women of God. It's a cause of mockery. And, and guess what? Instead of being discouraged, we need to build God's kingdom. I don't know if your family mocks you. If they, if they say, oh, you go to that church and you have that disease, oh, why don't they pray for you? Why don't they pray? Don't you say that God heals and now you have this disease? What's going on with you? And people have all kinds of opinions and they use criticism and mockery as a weapon. Now, let me tell you what Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37, 38. He says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Amen. Do you believe in Jesus? Amen. So let me tell you, Jesus is the source of the, of the living water. What is the living water? The living water, it's, it's the, the, the essence, the substance necessary to our spiritual life. In order to have life, you need to have water and nourishment. So Jesus, He's the source of the living water. Whenever, whenever you have water, you have life. If there's uh, dryness, there's death. So He's the source of the living water. And not only He says, come to me and drink because He's the source, but He, he told them, whoever drinks from me, now there's a source that will come out of their own heart. And that source will do what? Will bring life all around. So as Christians, we are called to be instruments in God's hands. We are called to be the source of living waters. We were not called to preach a religion. We were called to, to bring waters to those who are thirsty. And believe me, there's people out there that are thirsty for the power and for the presence of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, let me show you another verse that is not as nice. Are you ready? Let's go to the book of Revelation now. And in the book of Revelation, he's talking about also uh, some troubles that happened. Uh, some angels were commissioned and they were ordered to do certain things. And in the, uh, uh, chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it says, The third angel blew his trumpet and the great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Wormwood. Wormwood means calamity. And calamity brings death. So this is something that is about to happen. This is something that was prophesied. And it will happen in the natural. There will be a great poisoning. And whenever there's poisoning, there's usually 
one third that are poisoned and two thirds that are free from poisoning. You know, when Satan did a rebellion in heaven against the Lord, one third of the angels became what we call demons. But the other two thirds remained with the Lord. And what's happening here, it's the same proportion. It's one third of calamity for two thirds of blessing or life. But what the Bible is saying is that the water was poison. And let me tell you that in the spirit, what has happened in the church for these last uh, decades is that the power of God was being manifested. We were seeing signs and wonders all over the church. In the 80s, in the 90s, we were seeing winds of revival all over. And then suddenly, it's, it seems that it stopped. And people started to question and think, what happened? Isn't God present? Yes, the Lord is present. But there's something in the water. There's something in the water. There's something that is poisoning life instead of giving life. So it's very important for us to understand this principle. What was happening with Nehemiah in, in, in that situation is that a small group poisoned the water. And as they poisoned the water, the work stopped at half. Half job done. Let me tell you, God has something still to do in your life, in your family, in your children, in your husband. And maybe you're uh, in despair and you think, well, they had an opportunity, but now they're discouraged. They don't want to, anything to do with the Lord. It is time to give them good water. Amen. And that water comes from you. Comes from your heart. When your heart is surrendered to the Lord, there is life. And life more abundantly. Amen. Amen? Amen? So we don't want more wood. We don't want anything in the water. Praise God. We want to make sure that there is life. And we need to react. Now we need healing for discouragement. And uh, see the, the possibilities. Uh, uh, let me tell you this story. Uh, there's a fellow who sold insurance and went after a particularly difficult customer, uh, a man that uh, no one uh, had been able to sell insurance. And eventually, he sold him a $50,000 policy. Uh, this, this was in 1883. Uh, and. Um, and when the man was trying to write and, and just sign the policy, let me just uh, skip here to this slide. Uh, you know, remember those fountain pens? <laughs> I, I, I learned to write with, even before that one, I had to, <laughs> to dip the pen. <laughs> you know, like that's how old I am. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Well, it's true, you know, uh, I, I, I learned that there was no, no ball pe pe pens. They, they, they happened to be invented when I was uh, on grade uh, three or four. So, uh, the world changed, eh? Now we write in iPads and with a finger and we do all sorts of things. But they had these fountain pens. And this man had this insurance and the pen wouldn't write. He couldn't sign the contract, and he tried, and he tried, and he, he tried everything with a pen. And then he said, I'm sorry, no, I need to uh, come back to you, and uh, I, I need to, to bring another pen. And, but, but that man was so tough, he said, you know, guess what? I don't want to sign it anymore. And this salesman was so upset with the situation. He went home, and, and, and he was a, a, a very stubborn man and uh, ingenious also. So he decided that he, this will never happen to him again. He was going to build a fountain pen that wouldn't stop uh, writing. And the name of this man was Waterman. <laughs> and, and Waterman pens uh, uh, were the standard of fountain pens for 50 years. I know it's not in use now, now it's a relic. But how many of you have seen a Waterman pen? Oh, wow, <laughs> old people like me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm not that old, but, but in just 50 years, the world changed a lot. And, and these pens for 50 years were the standard of quality. And then we had Parker and all these, but Waterman was the inventor of the fountain pen. You see, when he had a, a, a trial, a difficulty in his life, he, he was mad, he was discouraged. 
Man, he was discouraged. But through that situation, he became wealthy. He became a multi-millionaire. And he began an industry that lasted for half a century. Isn't that something? So let's go back to Nehemiah. And uh, let me mention how, how can we overcome discouragement. The first thing we need to do is pray. You see, just before the passage we read on verse 4 and 5, when they had the, the first symptoms of, of an attack of discouragement, they did this important prayer, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O uh, our God, for we are despised. Turn back their tongues on their own heads and give them to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So they realized that they were not building something just for themselves. But they were obeying a plan. This is God's wall. It's not their wall. And we say the wall of Jerusalem. I, I call it the wall of the Lord. This is God's wall. You know, do you think that God is interested in, in walls and buildings and all these things? No, He's interested in us. But He wanted to teach them something very important. Not only to them, but to us. Generations after, centuries after. And we can look at what happened. And their prayer is an aggressive prayer. They're not, they're not just saying, Oh Lord, you see what they're doing to us? Oh Lord. No, no. No, they're, they're counter-attacking. They say, Lord, look at them. They're, they're just challenging you. They're provoking you. And we are witnesses. Who are that? They're the builders. In the presence of the builders. Now, healing for discouragement. First, you need to, uh, to do a prayer of trust in the Lord. So if you feel discouraged, there are circumstances in your life. You know, it's a disease. It's a problem. You twisted your ankle. There's something that happened. You're discouraged. You know, oh God, I'm doing these things. You're giving faithfully, as we were talking about tithes and offerings. You, you're giving your tithes faithfully. And it seems that you're always in trouble. But uh, when you pray we trust in the Lord, something starts to happen. And uh, you see, as, as the enemy started to criticize, they started to pray. Second thing. You need to establish new priorities. After they stopped, they had the same goal, but they used a different method. And, um, and, and Nehemiah said, okay, we're going to use, we're going to build, but we're going to use a different strategy. Now instead of building, you know, all over the place, each one of you is going to build in front of your own house. And you're going to build and finish the doors. And we're going to continue the work. And not only are you going to do this, but you're going to have a sword. And you're going, we're going to have soldiers. And if someone comes here to disturb us, we, that's war. We're not going to allow the, this work uh, to stop. So in, in our life, we can look into our life and maybe you're discouraged and something is going wrong. It is time. And the time is today to change your method. To have different priorities. Once I was talking to this lady... And this lady, had, uh, she was suffering with infirmities, so many problems. And she was always complaining. She was a woman of God. She was a, a dear Roman Catholic lady. And uh, she, she told me, you know, for more than 30 years that I light this candle to uh, Our Lady of, of, of um, Agony or something like that. Was a, you know, one of the, one of the names of the, of the lady. For more than 30 years. And I looked at her and I asked and is it working? She was really upset with me. <laughs> but I had to ask, is it working? Is it working? What do you mean, is it, is it working? I did this out of my love and my devotion. Yes, I know. But let me tell you, it's time to start praying to God instead of praying to Mary. Amen. I'm not saying that God cannot answer your prayer when you pray to Mary. But you need to address your Savior. You need to address God and not Mary. And if it's not working, it's time for you to change. Listen, it's time for us to change and to have progress in our spiritual life.
Now, I'm about to finish, but let me just give you two more points. Now, Nehemiah 4.13, it says, So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So here they are, and they are stationed by family, by clan, and they have swords, spears, and bows. So they're heavily armed. So... Uh, First thing you need to, uh, uh, another thing you need to do, I'm sorry, not the first, but the third thing you need to do is to trust your leadership. Trust the anointing of the leaders. You know, when we look around and we see so many churches that are defeated and Christians that are frustrated because there's lack of submission to authority. You know, we need pastors. In the book of Jude talks about a church that pastor themselves. You cannot pastor yourself. You need someone, you know, to, to, to listen from the Lord and to give you some hints, some orientation in what you need to do. And that's what they did. And then, number four, protect your clan. What's a clan? It's your tribe. It's your family. And uh, with this, I'm not talking about, you know, freedom for the Mohawk people, no, you deserve to be free. It's not a, a something, you know, our clan, our tribe, all this, or the, the French or the English. I'm not talking about this. Because this applied to them when they had those clans and those tribes and they were building by family, by clan. And the clan, it's more than the family. It was, you know, the gang, it was that group. You know, a church is a clan. In the spirit, the church is a clan. And the church, what shall we do? We build together. We build together. If the clan is divided, it's about to be destroyed. So we need to understand this principle, this spiritual truth. If there's a problem, we need to reorganize. And we are reorganized by clan. Now this is silent. You're looking at me. Maybe I'm stepping in something here. Maybe I'm stepping in something. But let me tell you this. If a group of people, if a family is divided, is about to split. If a church is divided, is about to split. To split. Now God's kingdom should not be divided, and we need to have this sense of family, this sense of clan. And when we have this sense, we pray for one another, we help one another, we encourage one another, we fight for one another. We not fight against each other. So when, when, uh, when uh, we are frustrated, there's rubbish and there's rubble in our life, we need other people to help us to rebuild, to reorganize. We need to uh, also to give up a discouragement and just, you know, get ready for the work. It's not about seeing others do the work. It's about you putting your hands to the, to the, to the work. Amen? Amen. Alright. Here's our plan. Is that a great plan? <laughs> Families, churches, you know, and we need to work to build the wall. Now, uh, when we have this vision, and we, when we have anointed leadership, we build a wall, we build here in Ganawaki. That's This is our wall. This is our portion of the wall. Then in Sharagay, there's some, someone else building their portion of the wall. Then we go to Dorval, someone is there building their portion of the wall. Then we go to Longueira, someone is there building their portion of the wall. And guess what? Sometimes no one is doing it. And God will rearrange things in order to make sure that His kingdom is established. Now in James, uh, chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8 it says submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to God and he will draw near to you cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double minded so it's very important to overcome discouragement to have uh, this attitude of resistance we're resisting the enemy we're resisting the devil we are the resistance we are the resistance here you know, the enemy is, is trying to invade the, the spiritual territory. And what are we about to do? Hide? No way. Christians don't hide. We fight back. 
and we fight in the spirit and we pray and we do the work of God and we build our families and we build our churches and we build God's kingdom and whenever, whenever someone is discouraged we need to make sure that the water that comes out of our heart is good water. 